You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In February 1864, a little over a year after the Emancipation Proclamation took effect, and the Union began to raise regiments of African-American soldiers to join in the fight against the Confederacy, one of those soldiers, Jacob Christie, wrote home to his family. By then, his regiment, the famed 54th Massachusetts, had battled Confederate forces on many occasions. And each of these encounters bolstered the belief of Jacob Christie and his fellow African-American soldiers that their actions and sacrifice on the field of battle strengthened their claims for freedom, equality, and citizenship when the war eventually ended. As Christie wrote, I do really think that it's God's will that this war shall not end till the colored people get their rights. It goes very hard for the white people to think of it, but by God's will and power, they will have their rights. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 68, in which we examine the story of the Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction. We are coming to you this week from the Freedmen's Bureau Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Whipping us into shape and keeping us all in line is our beloved drill sergeant, executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening at In the Past Lane this week? Well, the beautiful spring weather that we've all anticipated has finally arrived, and it seems like it's here to stay. Also arriving are the stacks of final papers and, in just a few days, final exams. But all that will be behind us in just a few weeks, and then it will be summer. Or as we say around here, summer. And speaking of nice weather and summer... You know what you need for the warm days that lie ahead? You need some In the Past Lane merch, of course. Check out our store at tpublic.com. That's T-E-E, public.com, forward slash user, forward slash In the Past Lane podcast. There you'll find a bunch of In the Past Lane t-shirts, but also dozens of shirts with pithy history-related quotations. Like Gustave Flaubert's line, quote, writing history is like researching an ocean and pissing a cupful. One of my personal favorites. Or the African proverb that says, Until the lions have their historians, the tale of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. We also have t-shirts that say, Historians against history repeating itself, with several variations like archivists against history repeating itself, and A-push students against history repeating itself, and so on. So you should check them out. And all this stuff comes not only as t-shirts, but also hoodies, mugs, tote bags, stickers, you name it. So please, check it out. I'll put a link to the merchandise in the show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. In other news, we have more supporters who have pledged support via Patreon or PayPal. Thanks to Lindsay J., David G., Kyle M., Susan M., and Robert O. I really, really appreciate the support. And if you other loyal listeners would like to help us defray the costs of making this podcast, just click on support at inthepastlane.com. Thanks. Finally, before we get to our main feature of this episode, my interview with Ed Ayers about his new book on the Civil War and Reconstruction, The Thin Light of Freedom, I want to point out to you several past episodes of In the Past Lane that touch on this time period, such as episode 59, where I talked to historian Ann Bailey about her book, The Weeping Time, about the largest slave auction in U.S. history right on the eve of the Civil War, or episode 44 with Richard White talking about Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, episode 35 that tells the story of Albert Cashier, a transgender soldier fighting for the Union, or episode 20, where I talked to Douglas Edgerton about his book on black soldiers in the Union Army during the Civil War. Or episode 4, where I interview historian Manisha Sinha about her book on the history of the abolition movement. Okay, you know the rest. 
Please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. And tell your friends and family about the podcast. That really helps us expand our listening community. Thanks. Okay, people. Time to strike the tents and get moving. Your journey in the past lane begins now. All right, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell here at In the Past Lane. And with me now is historian Edward L. Ayers, author of the new book, The Thin Light of Freedom, The Civil War and Emancipation in the Heart of America. Ed is the author of many books and articles on the era of the Civil War, including the Bancroft Prize-winning book, In the Presence of Mine Enemies, The Civil War in the Heart of America, 1859-1864. to That book is actually volume one of Ed's long-term project on the Civil War with his latest book being Volume 2. Ed Ayers is also Professor of Humanities and President Emeritus at the University of Richmond. And of course, many listeners to In the Past Lane are avid fans of the terrific history podcast Backstory, where Ed serves as a co-host. Ed Ayers, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thanks so much. Delighted to be with you. All right. Well, I'd like to begin by asking you to tell us, well, I guess there's no escaping the word, uh, the backstory to this book. Uh, it's, it, <laughs> it's actually the second volume in what has turned out to be a remarkable long-term project called The Valley of the Shadow. I know our listeners would, would be fascinated to learn you know, how you conceived of the idea of centering this story of the Civil War on two communities, one union and one confederate. And then you know, as that project unfolded, how your research discovered so much rich documentation of the lives of ordinary people, which is really in some ways the primary focus of this work. So could you tell us more about that? I like the way you phrased it. It's a remarkable long-term project. You might have said it's remarkably (laughs) long-term project (laughs) because uh, truth be known, uh, I had the first ideas for this in 1990, 1991. Uh, I was driving in the Shenandoah Valley and on I-81 and saw a sign for the New Market Battlefield. And I had always been struck by the beauty of the Shenandoah Valley, but suddenly I realized that it had been a place that had seen some of the longest fighting and most destruction in the American Civil War. And suddenly the 23rd Psalm of the Valley of the Shadow of Death leapt into my mind. And I decided that how was it that Americans could learn to hate each other in enough yeah in a matter of weeks uh, to go to war for four years. And and I decided Shenandoah Valley would be a good place to do it because here it doesn't have any of the usual it's not industrial north and agrarian south, or it's not, you know, cotton versus textile mill. You know, yeah. It's the same people. <laughs> uh, but there's one line on the ground, and below it is slavery, and above it is not. So I decided that I would focus on this boundary, the border, to see how two places, Pennsylvania and Virginia, that we don't think of as being the deep north or the deep south, could be so centrally involved in this story. So it began with a kind of a question of okay, what if we didn't take the Civil War for granted as a natural outgrowth of the problem of slavery, but actually watch people as they descended into a war that no one wanted, and then somehow it became a process by which the largest and most powerful system of slavery in the modern world came to an end in just four years. And what was what's particular about um, the two counties? So it's not just two states, it's actually two counties and really in some ways two towns, Yeah, separated only by 200 miles. That's right both in the valley. So the proximity is really fascinating from a project standpoint, but it's also borne out in the stuff you found too. So tell us more about that. I chose them because both of them have two newspapers every week throughout this entire period. And because I knew that the soldiers from the two places fought in the major battles of the Eastern Theater. But I also chose them because Augusta County, uh, where Stanton is in Virginia, had the average number of slaves for the South as a whole, about 25% of the population. And Franklin County, Chambersburg, the northern community, voted for Abraham Lincoln in almost exactly the same proportion as the North as a whole. In those ways, they're typical. I also chose them, perversely enough, because they both suffered a lot in the war. Uh, Both were occupied by the other army, and Chambersburg, not to ruin anything for those people who read Thin Light of Freedom, is burned to the ground one morning in July of 1864. And so they experience every facet of the Civil War, guerrilla fighting and big armies and the end of slavery and political campaigns and all this sort of stuff. So I chose them because they seem like core samples of the North and of the South. But as you say, Ed, they are swept up in the same story. Their histories interact and intersect. So 
the thing that's kind of weird about all this is that your listeners who are astute Students of technology will know that in 1991, there was no way to share any of this with other people because the World Wide Web didn't exist. Yep. So to make a very long story short, we devised what was we were told called a website, <laughs> and we were on the web within six months of its introduction to the world. And uh, the basic premise is this. Let's gather every piece of information about every person who lived in those two communities and then share it with the world. And my books won't just be the product of the person who happens to own the note cards, but the person who can tell the best story out of all that massive information. So there's 10,000 pages of newspapers, letters, and diaries, and the largest collection of letters from African-American soldiers of any family in the in a country. And the only diary where a man and a woman kept parallel diaries at home and on the home front. So all that is kind of luck. I'll just be honest with you. I didn't know all those great things existed. But it's a little daunting to realize if you just choose two counties, not quite at random, that you can build a website that takes 14 years to gather all that information. Yeah, <laughs> it gives you some idea of the depth and complexity of American history. So those are kind of long answers for a long project. The basic premise behind all of this, wouldn't it be great if we had a story of the Civil War that included everybody in the society? men and women in black and white and soldier and civilian and northern and southern. And if we went all the way from John Brown's raid all the way to the 15th Amendment as volume two does. Yeah, and it seems that's really the one of the you know hallmarks of your work here is that it's, I mean, there's so many books on the Civil War, as you know. In fact, you've, you've contributed to them. But <laughs> this one really takes that on the ground view of many, many ordinary people, white and black, enslaved and free, and you know people have, in positions of power and people that are just anonymous. And what's terrific, particularly in this era, is that so many people write so many letters and also keep such detailed diaries. And then, you know, through the chances of history, the, these things end up being preserved for you and your researchers to find and then to digitize. So it's it's a really amazing project from that perspective. It gives a whole new view on the Civil War. And it's not just social history. It's each of these incidents that are key to the war, all these battles and political decisions are also sort of woven into it. So you get a sense of like, what is it like to open up the newspaper? at any given moment in the, you know, say the fall of 1862, and to read in real time the unfolding accounts of what's actually happening at, at a place like Antietam. Yeah. And, you know, what was lucky is that I worried that this book, The Thin Light of Freedom, starts on the day before Gettysburg and goes through 1870 in the passage of the 15th Amendment. And, you know, this remarkably rich vein of evidence that you're talking about for the war people go back home and they stop writing letters to each other. Mm -hmm. And I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to sustain the story in as interesting a way. But fortunately, it turns out then the Freedmen's Bureau and white teachers in the North and newspapers and investigations by Congress all came in and sort of gave us other kinds of sources. So I was relieved that I was able to follow that same method of sort of following all this story kind of week by week, in North and South, uh, all the way through really the creation of Reconstruction. Yeah, that's a different set of resources, but still very, very rich. Well, why don't we pivot from here to uh, talk about the book itself? So this is volume, well, volume one starts from John Brown's raid in 1859 and leads us up to the spring of 1863. And then this volume picks up the story with Robert E. Lee and the Confederate Army's invasion of Pennsylvania, a decision that, of course, leads to the epic clash at Gettysburg. Tell us what the status of the war is at this point. I mean, the war's two years old, and a lot right. has changed. A lot of people's original perceptions of what the war would be like and how long it would last and who would win and so many other things have been radically changed by May, June of 1863. So tell us, set us up that way. You're exactly right. And yet people can't imagine how this is going to end. I mean, so Lee writes his wife that he's going to go into Pennsylvania to demonstrate to white Northerners that they can't have any faith in Abraham Lincoln any longer that even after all the enormous sacrifices of these two years of war, all the men who've died, that Robert E. Lee can still just ride right into one of the richest states of the North. And I think one of the things about the book is I'm pointing out that politics and the military events are so tightly tied together that they can't be understood apart. So Lee is already thinking about the 1864 presidential election in the North. And so you know, we think of it as, you know, sort of this failed crusade to just bring the war to an end. Right. But he thinks that he's going to actually have to feed his army, which is, you know, just decimating Virginia, both the Union and the Confederate armies. 
are just eating Virginia to the ground. So let's go to Pennsylvania. Let's stock up. Let's fill hundreds and hundreds of wagons. Let's, let's take tens of thousands of cattle and pigs and ship all this stuff back down, actually through Stanton mm-hmm. into Virginia. So they go in with great confidence. They've just won big victories at Chancellorsville. And you know they've lost Stonewall Jackson, but they think this might be the thing that ends the war. And I don't want to ruin it for people, but it doesn't. (laughs) And you'll notice that when you read the story is I don't tell all the details of the Battle of Gettysburg again. Matter of fact, I tell it from the viewpoint of people who were 25 miles away. What could they know? What could they hear? And what was it like when a 17-mile-long wagon train of dead and wounded rolled back through their county on the way back to Virginia? So I think that people who know a lot about the Civil War will be a little surprised. I have to admit, this book is written for people who don't think they're interested in the Civil War. I'm trying to persuade people. Really, the most important event in our history is actually interesting. (laughs) Right. Even though you think it's all been sort of said and done, it actually turns out that they didn't know how it was going to turn out. So I think that being able to follow my people in the Confederate Army into Pennsylvania, but then seeing it through my people's eyes in Pennsylvania is a fortunate way to be able to begin the book. But it begins in a very sad note is that the first thing that the Northerners see are black people fleeing the Confederate army coming up the valley. Right. And, and there's that very powerful description by one of the people's whose diaries you, you have in great detail. Yeah, Rachel, Rachel Cormany. Cormany. Yeah. Describing those scenes. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, she's sitting there, you know, with her baby and on the porch in Chambersburg. And suddenly uh, all of these African-American people on wagons and horseback and running are trying to get away from the Confederates. And one of the first things that the Confederates do when they come into Pennsylvania is round up those people, whether they had been in slavery before or not, and ship them back down to Virginia. And so the first signs of Lee's invasion is not waving flags and marching troops, but actually African-American people being taken into slavery. So since part of the book is one of its purposes is to weave together the story of the war with the story of emancipation and reconstruction, this reminds us that something that's usually seen as just kind of a battlefield set, in fact, is deeply entangled with this great struggle over freedom. That leads me to ask a question about one of, you know, one of the themes in both of your books is this broad theme of, I guess I'd call it transformation. You know, yeah. So in the first yeah. volume, it's how is it that so many Southerners who are staunch unionists, really right. not secessionists, staunch unionists until secession, and then they flip a switch almost immediately yep. and become pretty all-in Confederates. You know, that's a really profound transformation. And in this book, one of the similar kinds of transformation involves Northern whites who, before the war, are, you know, I guess at best indifferent on the issue of slavery, yeah. many of them anyway, and certainly indifferent, if not hostile, to the idea of rights for African Americans. And you chronicle how this great transformation, at least among a big chunk of the Northern white population, to beginning to, you know, essentially to support what is an expanded war effort of destroying slavery. And then after the war, an even bigger expansion into the idea of granting citizenship and civil rights to ex-slaves after the Civil War. So how does this second transformation take place? What are some of the key elements that go into it? Yeah, it'll be surprising to us, but it turns out a political party can do remarkably good things. You know, that the Republican Party actually makes people better than they were (laughs) before because it, it links the half of the northern population that will support Abraham Lincoln to making the purpose of the war not merely to restore the United States, which frankly might have been done more easily if you didn't destroy slavery. You could have come together more quickly with a compromise or something, but instead having the courage to say, no, we need to root out the cause of the war, which is slavery, and to see it through. So that's inspiring. Indeed. And it shows you how it's not just Abraham Lincoln who grows, but it's everyday voters who get an expanded moral sense of what this might all be about. And also soldiers, too. So Union soldiers who, you know, head into the South, they begin to encounter enslaved people, but also enslaved people who have emancipated themselves, what are called contrabands. And so these Northern soldiers, many of them go South with the ideas from popular culture that slaves are docile, that they like slavery, that slavery is beneficial to them, that they don't really want freedom. It's just crazy abolitionists who say that they do. Right. And they're on the ground experience with self-emancipated slaves has a way of shaping certainly many people's expectations and understandings of what slavery was and what the world would look like without slavery. Yeah. And the main vehicle by which that sense is spread 
is the Republican Party because they need to win. They need to persuade people, look, what we're fighting for is worthy and feasible. And so you'll see letters from the soldiers in the field reproduced in Republican newspapers. But it's important to point out that Abraham Lincoln basically persuades nobody who didn't already vote for the Republicans to vote for him in 1864. And 47 to 48% of white Northern men refused to support Abraham Lincoln, even in the midst of the Civil War. And I think we need to remember that it's not just Northerners, you know, it's not just, you know, progress, but this is a hard fought battle inside the North. And that I emphasize the opposition Lincoln. And the Republicans faced not to diminish their accomplishment, but actually to accentuate it. This didn't just happen because white Northerners, the way, frankly, we often tell ourselves, generally awakened to the evil of slavery, but because white Democrats in the North fought against it in the most vehement racist language we can imagine all the way through emancipation and into Reconstruction, which helps make Reconstruction comprehensible if you understand that half of white Northerners and almost all of white Southerners never supported reconstruction. And so it makes us appreciate the fact that it went as far as it did. That it happened is amazing. Yeah. And one thing that stood out to me was not only all the things you say, but specifically to Franklin County, Pennsylvania, that there's a real strong democratic political presence there. And getting a little ahead of ourselves, I think the editor comments or you know dismisses Lincoln's what we think of now as his famous second inaugural address right, right. as quote trash yeah just says it's just it's just garbage yeah so there's really a lot of internal opposition within the union uh-huh. but I want to back up a step before the second inauguration to talk about another key theme that you talk about and I know this from hearing you speak and from backstory and also from you know, reading other works of, by you that, you know, you really take to heart that and try to emphasize that notion that nothing in history is inevitable. It's right. all one uncertainty after another. And people, we know what happens, but people in, in real time have no idea what's what's happening. And you really see that in the election of 1864, the Civil War. Sometimes people say that, you know, Gettysburg was the turning point of the Civil War. But yeah. Very few people at the time know that or or have even a sense of that because huge numbers of people are going to die in the next uh, two years before the war comes to a conclusion. And in the midst of all that, there is this crazy moment where the democracy has to function and you have to have an election in the midst of a civil war. And as you point out, Lincoln is facing it's not inevitable by any means. In fact, he thinks to a large degree he's not going to win. And yet another point you make, which is that these political struggles are intimately tied to the military struggles. So tell us a little bit more about the that moment in 1864, a full year plus after Gettysburg and how everything is still very much up in the air. Yeah, I think that I'll be curious to see what my military historian friends think about this. But the common story is that in August of 1864, Lincoln does not think he's going to win for good reason, because partly you still have Sherman outside of Atlanta, unable to break that army. And you have Grant facing Lee in Virginia, unable to break the largest Confederate army. And so going into the election, after all this sacrifice, you've not been able to take either of these two goals. It places real doubts about your efficacy. So the Democrats wait to the last minute to have their convention to harvest all this discontent and nominate George McClellan to be their nominee. And when they get home, Atlanta has fallen. And so suddenly their argument that we must have peace. But then I argue that, you know, you still have Robert E. Lee in Virginia, and you've got Jubal Early threatening the outskirts of Washington, D.C., and burning Chambersburg, Pennsylvania to the ground, that it matters a lot what happens in the Shenandoah Valley in the fall of 1864, which is it's burned. Sheridan creates this enormous army, storms down through the Shenandoah Valley, burns enormous numbers of farms, and this is what Northern voters vote on, not Sherman's march to the sea, which hasn't happened yet. (laughs) And so if you really want to see what Americans are willing to support, how much destruction of each other, you see they like the idea of burning the Shenandoah Valley. And Southerners like the idea of burning a defenseless northern town of Chambersburg to the ground with two hours warning. Right. Things that may have been unthinkable just, you know, at the outset of the war that good, decent Christian soldiers would never do such a thing. But War has a way of reshaping people's morals and expectations. Exactly. And people are sick about it. At the same time, they're intoxicated by it. You know, they recognize that this is terrible, but the enemy deserves it. So this happens. The big victories in the Valley happen in October. We're used to referring now to an October surprise, right, in elections. Well, the October surprise was that the Shenandoah Valley finally fell to the United States. 
right outside of Washington, D.C., and that impels Lincoln to victory. We have a future president of the United States says that Sheridan's victories are worth more than all the speeches anybody's given in this election. So I think that for us to understand that nothing is really settled until the fall of 1864 is important to understand everything that happened before. Because the major enemy in understanding the Civil War is we think we already know what happened. We've got to forget how it turned out and see each moment in all its possibility. Right, because that's how the people involved in it saw it. Yeah, and made their decisions. They acted the way they did because they didn't know how it was going to turn out. So I'm not much of one to sit in judgment of the people of the past. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's hard living today. It was hard living then. And so there's kind of a genre of Civil War history, which is second guessing generals and presidents. And I just don't do that. I'm like, yeah, look at the situation they're in. How could they have known how this is going to turn out? Right. I don't know if it's a genre so much as it seems almost like an industry, but <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, right. well, eventually the war does come to a conclusion in 1865, and that pretty well settles, at least it seemingly settles the question of slavery. Yeah. But as you point out, the vast majority of enslaved people are still enslaved. And so the next chapter that unfolds, which over the last 30 years of history and recent history has really become inseparable from the Civil War story, the story of Reconstruction. And uh, you focus on those critical first five years where a lot of the victories of the Civil War and some of the outcomes of the Civil War really kind of made concrete in the form of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And the story continues to unfold on the ground in the communities that you've studied. So tell us more about that second struggle of the Civil War. Yeah, I do think my book's a little bit weird in having as much war in a book about emancipation as it does and of having as much war in the history of Reconstruction. Now, we can all still see the effects of Vietnam on our society today, right. and yet we tend to divide the story of the Civil War and Reconstruction in 1865, forgetting it's the same people <laughs> struggling with exactly the same issues, with the same hatred and bitterness. White Northerners are eager to get their sons home. You know, they've just sacrificed years of their lives to fight the South. And my experience in speaking around the country is that people don't really understand or Reconstruction, as we think of it, doesn't begin until two years after the war. Right. And why does it? In the same way that white Southerners caused emancipation by seceding, white Southerners caused Reconstruction by refusing to accept really any modification other than the legal ending of slavery. And the White North Republican Party says we have no choice but to come in, militarily reoccupy it, make them write entirely new constitutions, let black men vote for those elections and actually be delegates, except the right of 14th Amendment that enshrines due process of law and, and birthright citizenship, and then write another amendment that says that you can vote regardless of your race. Those things would not have been foreseen at the beginning of Reconstruction, but the White South basically forced Northern Republicans in the face of opposition from Northern Democrats to put those in place. So ironically, yeah. it's the resistance to occasions of freedom that extend the boundaries of freedom. It's fascinating. And in, when you look at that, that five-year period, it's really a, a revolutionary period and you know, an incredible experiment in multiracial democracy and redefining of what it means to be a citizen and all of that. And you know, I often talk to my students about this and I say, you know, if we stop the clock in 1870, it's an extraordinary moment in the, you know, the expansion of what it means to be a democracy and a republic and our notions of, of rights and liberties. But the clock in history, of course, never stops and it keeps going. And then there's this great unraveling, dismantling of Reconstruction and the imposition of Jim Crow. So it's a story of incredible accomplishment, but one that's really tarnished by the aftermath. And it's something that we're still living with. Maybe we could head towards the end of this interview by asking you about what's the legacy? I always ask my historians uh, who I talk to, you know, your book is really fascinating in and of itself, but what does it say to us today? And of course, we don't have to. (laughs) <laughs> look too hard to see the fact that the Civil War, we're still fighting it right now in 2017, 2018, with arguments about Confederate monuments and misstatements by public officials about the origins of the Civil right. War and how it could have turned out differently. So what's the, the long-term legacy of the period that you cover in this book? Yeah, people really struggle with what Reconstruction means and when it ends. And I had my students go online to see what's our general sense of our culture about Reconstruction. And they came back and said, you know, the one word that recurs the most is failure. And that's the way we teach it very often in high mm-hmm. school. Right. And that kind of smothers 
our sense of aspiration of what's possible in history. I end the book with a young man who was born into slavery and his father dies digging trenches around Richmond to defend the Confederacy. He'd been dragged from slavery in Augusta County down there to do that. But he goes to the Freedmen's Bureau School, and then he goes to the Republican Party, and then he opens his own newspaper, and then he marries a woman who is also a teacher because she had a chance for an education. Both of their parents had come before the Freedmen's Bureau in 1866 and declared they were married in the eyes of the state of Virginia as well as in the eyes of God. And I point out that, okay, the policies that white people created were rolled back. But black people seized on this thin light of freedom to make lives for themselves despite that. Mm. And there's no understanding the civil rights movement if we don't understand how an indigenous black middle class, highly respectable, highly educated, highly ambitious, managed to keep that light alive during all the years of darkness, of segregation and lynching. So I think that if we measure reconstruction by what white people did, it is a story of failure. If we imagine it as a story of what black people were able to seize from that moment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the right to own property, the right to be married, the right not to have your children sold away from you, the right for an education, in those ways, reconstruction paid dividends for generations to come that changed American history. So, you know, I think that we usually think of the Civil War as a story of two sides, the North and the South, but it's actually three. The African-American story is its own story. They would take whatever advantage they could get from whatever the situation might offer and make new lives for themselves. So that's my take, but is that it mattered a lot that slavery ended instantly without compensation Mm -hmm. and with political rights, even though they later were taken away. It mattered. So that's my belief that history is a lot of times about seeds that are planted that take a while to bloom rather than just a sequence of events. Right. And I think one way that I'd like to make that connection with my students is to, you know, have them read parts of the I Have a Dream speech in in 1963 by Martin Luther King, because one of the themes he strikes is he says, look, we, we are here to help America live up to the promise of its own words, you know, of freedom and citizenship and opportunity and so forth, saying essentially we're not asking for anything new. We're asking for them to live up to what's already in the Constitution, and it's already in the Constitution because of what happens in the five years after the Civil War with those three crucial amendments and then also the raised expectations of African Americans. And this is obviously you know, a continuing story right. right up to the present day. All right, one last question. You're a regular old professional historian who does real scholarship and all of that and works at a university, but you are also a public historian, and you know you co-host the Backstory podcast. So I'm curious for you to tell us what it's like to wear that second hat and how the podcast in some ways has maybe changed your approach to what you do. Yeah, it's a good question. We, we started it back in 2007 as a radio show before podcasts existed. And we walked into it not knowing really what we were doing. It was the vision of a producer at a local radio station. He says, you know, what we'd like to do is car talk for history. <laughs> and, and my colleague, Peter Oma, said, well, there's two problems with that. One, I'm not funny. And two, history's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so it took us a while to find, you know, what we would do. But then it turned out there, we thought it might be a call-in show and so forth. But then we evolved this idea of that we would deal with a theme each week and explore it from different angles. Sometimes it would be a theme that was ripped from the headlines, as we say. Other times it would be sort of an evergreen, you know, a holiday show. What's the history of Thanksgiving? Things like that. And then we hired this really brilliant young man, Tony Field, who came in and said, there are these new things called podcasts. And I think that if we would make those as well as our radio show, we could have greater control over what we're doing. So we were on 200 and some NPR stations, but we decided that we would go to all podcasts so that we could sustain the show financially, Mm -hmm. but also that we could, if the interview needed to go 40 minutes, we would do that. If it needed to be four, (laughs) we would do that and and not have to stop for the usual breaks and so forth. And I should say, so I was president of the University of Richmond for eight years, and most of the time we've done backstory, I was president. And I was in Richmond. Everybody else was in Charlottesville, Virginia. And we would get together virtually at 7.30 in the morning before my work as president began and make the show at the crack of dawn. So I'm grateful to all my colleagues Mm. for continuing to do that. 
So we've made 200 shows now, and we love it. We haven't run out of history yet. That's right. <laughs> and we kind of rebooted. You know, we started with three older white men just because we were colleagues at the University of Virginia making the show. But now Joanne Freeman from Yale and Nathan Connolly from Johns Hopkins give us whole perspectives that we've needed. And it's so exciting to kind of reboot and have these other perspectives on it. So it turns out that a lot of people are interested in history. You kind of have to meet them halfway. Yes. You just give them a, a shelf of monographs. It turns out that they're not very interested. But if you'll kind of reach out and say, you haven't really thought about this, but this is history too. People respond to it. It's, it's been thrilling. I've never begrudged a, a day that I needed to stop and do backstory in the midst of my other history work. <laughs> that's terrific. And I think one of the things that's great about you know history podcasting is that you can be entertaining and just interesting, but also really thought provoking. And you guys really do get into topical issues that are uncomfortable. And I mean, I, I have a vivid memory of your post Charlottesville yeah. show where you had a, because that was not only just topical, but it was very geographically, right? You were all right. very closely connected to Charlottesville, some people in Charlottesville. So it's a great thing to be able to combine that sort of grabbing people because they love history, but then also nudging them to think more critically and more widely and see connections between things. The tagline to my podcast is the, the podcast about history and why it matters. And I guess there's all of us doing this sort of thing. That's kind of the, the operating principle. Yeah, I think we're, we'll help make audience for each other. As people can see, there's lots of different ways to do this. We don't do very much of this, of actually talking to people about new books. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity and, and grateful for your great questions. It's a little intimidating. I just feel like I kind of had my PhD exam because you, you <laughs> actually read the book and had good questions. And I really appreciate that, Ed. All right, Ed. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate it. And good luck with the book and all the events uh, associated with it. My pleasure. Edward L. Ayers is author of the book, The Thin Light of Freedom, The Civil War and Emancipation in the Heart of America, published by W.W. Norton and Company. Ed is also co-host of the American History Podcast, Backstory. Alright everyone, time to close out this episode of In the Past Lane. As always, thanks for listening. To learn more about the stuff we discussed in this episode, just go to our show page at inthepastlane.com. There you'll find recommended readings, links, and more. And people, please, send us your comments, questions, and suggestions via Twitter, where I tweet as at In the Past Lane, and Instagram, same thing, In the Past Lane, and Facebook at In the Past Lane Podcast. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, I think I've come up with a brilliant idea. Oh, no, not again. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. 